So there's this verse from the Hebrew scriptures that goes like this. It's from the prophet Isaiah. The people in darkness have seen a great light. It speaks to me every time, and at first what intrigued me was what it didn't say. It didn't say the people who believe in God have seen a great light, or the people who pray have seen a great light, or the people who uh, gave their money to the poor have seen a great light, or the people who are kind. But it says the people who, are, who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. And it, it raised the question for me, is there something about darkness that can actually help us see? And I have to say that my life suggests that the answer is yes. Because in moments of darkness, I have seen a lot. One of the things that I've seen is kind of the way the world works and how privileged I am in it. I remember one really horrible panic and misery-filled night that I spent with my mother in the emergency room. And I remember being keenly aware of how blessed I am that English is my first language. I never think about that, how much easier that makes my life, but it was very vivid for me then. There have been times when my life has been hard and I found out a lot about myself. Sometimes I have been disabused of some very appealing fantasies about myself, some very precious illusions, and other times I have found out that there is more to me than I thought. But what I really want to talk about tonight is how the darkness sometimes helps us to see other people. Sort of the way the night shows us the stars. And so I'll tell you a story. When our son Ash was 21, he was spending the semester in Prague, and my husband A.T. and I decided that we would take him to Paris for a weekend to celebrate, and we had a wonderful time. The last morning, we had planned to visit the area of the Eiffel Tower, and then we were going to go out to lunch in a really swanky restaurant, and that was what I was looking forward to the most. So I had already been to the top of the Eiffel Tower, so I decided to sit it out. And Ash and A.T. went up, and we had a deal that we'd meet underneath at the base at 1230. I had skipped breakfast that morning because I wanted to be really hungry for the restaurant. So when 12.30 came, I was ready, and I went to the base of the Eiffel Tower, and I didn't see them. I didn't see them at 12.45 or 1 o'clock. So, you know, our friends in 12-step programs tell us that if we're hungry, ang too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, we probably aren't going to make really good decisions. Well, I was hungry, resentful, tired, frustrated, anxious cold, so I was like eight for four. And so by the time I saw them, I was filled with both relief and a little frustration, but mostly relief because I thought we could still get to the restaurant on time if we took a cab. I could feel the linen underneath my fingertips as I saw them walk toward me. And they came toward me smiling, and they told me that they had gotten hungry and they had stopped at, I know, they had stopped at a crepe stand and had lunch. So I'm figuring that the women in the audience at this point are saying, oh, and the men are saying, what? <laughs> so it was the last day of Ash's birthday trip and I didn't want to ruin anything, so I thought fast. And I decided that what I would do is I would do my impression of somebody who rolls with the punches and is really flexible and easy to get along with. <laughs> but that is, in fact, so far from the truth that as we walked away, I realized I could not sustain it for even one block. <laughs> and so as the three of us were talking, I started edging forward. And I was putting more and more distance between me and my husband and my son. And I started to walk faster and I started to walk harder. And I felt myself fueled by this collection of feelings. It wasn't that I was cranking myself up, although believe me when I tell you I know how to do that, it was different. 
It was more as if a gate that I keep closed was going to open. And this collection of other hurts and disappointments and times maybe where I felt like I hadn't been considered were going to burst forth. So I walked faster and faster, and I, I could still, I can still see the mosaics of the sidewalks under my feet as I went. And then I realized that my son, Ash, had caught up with me. Now I had not, I, don't, I no longer had a plan. I didn't exactly know what I was going to do, but I walked faster. <laughs> he was a linebacker on the football team, so it wasn't hard for him to pick up the pace and match my gait. But I kept walking until he leaned over as we walked and he said quietly, Mom, you can walk as fast as you want, but I'm walking with you. And I looked up I guess you could say that I was a person who had been walking in darkness. And so when I looked up, what I saw was a great light. I saw the great light of my son. And I know it was a light because I could see him. And I could see him in a more complete way, I think, than I had ever seen him before. And it was great because he had the power actually to change the story. Because I could be standing here telling you a story about how hurt I was. But instead, I'm telling you a story about how alone I wasn't. You know, I've been listening to people professionally for a quarter of a century. And I can tell you that all around us, people are walking in darkness. And that includes people who, from the outside, appear to be in, a possession, in possession of a personal empire on which the sun does not set. Some of the darkness comes from circumstance. Disease, death, shocks, financial setbacks. But in my experience, the deepest darkness comes from broken relationships. Relationships in which we've let other people down, they've let us down, or we've let ourselves down. And that darkness is deep and it can be long. It also gives us an enormous and very precious opportunity as fellow human beings. And that opportunity is for us to walk, walk towards those people in the darkness. It doesn't take a lot of skill. It takes the capacity to tolerate awkwardness and discomfort. And the message that we want to convey is that they matter to us and that they cannot walk fast enough or far enough to move beyond the limits of our love and concern and regard and respect for them. And when we do that, we can't always lift the darkness. But we can warm it up. And we can even change the story. And so my guess, my invitation, or maybe my challenge to you is to be one of those people who walks toward and with others who are walking in darkness. Because when you do, and when you convey the message of regard and concern and respect and love, they're going to notice that the story has changed. It's going to get their attention and they're going to look up. And when they do, the great light that they see before them will be you. Thank you.